No, perfect. Thank you very much. Right, moving forward onto item nine, the Auckland Water Strategy Annual Information Annual Implementation Update. We've got Olivia, Tess, and Dave. Thank you very much. If you just want to introduce uh, your roles, and I'm not sure who wants to kick off. Oh, Dave would like to. Um, yeah, this is a really good, um, a good news story in many cases. Thank you. Uh, kia ora. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, and uh, this is the uh, opportunity to present the uh, annual report on the Auckland Water Strategy uh, as it was um, approved in March 2022. And uh, this is an update, the annual report. And so I'd like to introduce uh, Tess Langworthy, Project Manager of Water, uh, sitting next to me, and Liv Blanchard, Senior Analyst uh, within the Natural Environment Strategy Unit of the Policy Department. So I'll hand it over to them for about a 10-minute presentation. Kia ora. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, as Dave mentioned, we're here to provide an annual update on the progress of the Auckland Water Strategy over its second year of implementation from July of 2023 to June of 24. And in this presentation, we'll give an overview of progress in that year, highlight some of the areas of risk and mitigation approaches, and identify council group priorities going into year three, 24-25. The Auckland Water Strategy is our region's 30-year vision towards achieving te modi o te wai, the life-sustaining capacity of Auckland's water is protected and enhanced. As Dave mentioned, it was adopted by the then Environment and Climate Change Committee in March 22, along with an implementation plan. And the strategy directs activities across the council group, across um, eight different transformational changes and thematic areas. These range from how we partner with Mana Whenua to implement its direction to how we improve the regenerative nature of our infrastructure. And these eight areas for transformational change are called strategic shifts, and you'll hear us refer to them throughout this presentation. Each strategic shift is underpinned by approximately five to 10 actions that aim to advance the direction of that shift with indicative timeframes for those that were set out in the implementation plan. The report itself sets out some of the operating context and engagement approaches that supported implementation over this year, and the slides has some of the highlights from that. Engagement with Mana Whenua included both collective engagement and individual hui. All 19 Mana Whenua entities were approached uh, to meet on implementation and key work areas of the strategy in this year, and 15 were available to meet between March and July, with the remaining four to be met with in year three. Key legislative developments this year included changes to water services legislation and proposed changes to resource management legislation. And it's key for us to note that changes like this at the central government level don't impact our commitment to the strategy or its direction. They can, however, affect how we're able to progress that direction and in what timeframes we're able to do that. The strategy is implemented by staff across the organization, both through embedding its direction in our ongoing work programs and also initiating new work where that's directed by actions in the strategy. And it's important to note the change envisioned in the strategy is long term and its indicative scoping for delivery was ambitious. 80% of the 58 actions in the, in the strategy were indicatively scoped to be delivered in the first three years of implementation. The annual report for year two provides a snapshot of progress in this year by focusing on the status of those 58 actions and how they contribute to the aims of the strategic shifts that they sit within, as well as our progress towards quantitative targets that were adopted with the strategy. The report is just one tool that we use to evaluate implementation on an annual basis, and council staff are exploring more holistic long-term evaluation methods on the impact of the strategy. And those kinds of holistic evaluations, particularly after the significant milestone of year three, would be an important input to any future changes to the strategy that may be considered. The water strategy was approved with quantitative targets that help us achieve our water efficiency goals by reducing per capita consumption and boosting our recycled water capacity. In this past year, water cares metrics show that per capita consumption increased compared to the previous year by about 14 liters per person per day. This isn't overly concerning and is likely more representative of normal demand, given that the previous three years were likely impacted by things like drought restrictions, COVID lockdowns, and the record rainfall we experienced last year. 
we are still on track to achieve the 2025 target of reducing per capita consumption below 253 liters per person per day. Recycled water capacity increased over this last year to over 22 million liters per day. And this volume represents WaterCare's wastewater reuse in its wastewater treatment plants and some construction projects. It does not include rainwater tank volumes for which an investigation at council is underway. Moving into the status of the 58 actions, this slide is a snapshot of the red, amber, green status of those 58 actions across the strategy at the end of year two. It lays out the eight strategic shifts there on the left from top to bottom and their supporting actions from left to right. And a red status indicates that the action is overdue. Amber indicates that it's progressing with some challenges or maybe at risk of not achieving the envisioned timeframes. And a green status indicates that it's on track or complete. Specific details on the implementation status of all 58 actions can be found in Appendix 1 or Attachment B to your agenda report. And some of the challenges or risks associated with amber or red actions um, are also outlined in that appendix. The key takeaway for this slide is that the volume of work progressing across the strategy is massive. Uh, and the next slide breaks this down a bit further. Over the 23-24 financial year, the report shows significant progress in the enhancing the resilience of our communities and our infrastructure to natural hazards. And this really reflects the attention and resourcing that's been dedicated to this work over the last year. It also outlines some of the technical work and engagement around improving the Auckland Unitary Plan to better manage fresh water in ways that advance strategic direction to integrate land use planning and water outcomes and take a catchment based approach to the health of our water ecosystems. And despite that progress on the AUP, we are challenged to embed Te Muri o Te Wai in our planning framework in the timeframes that were envisioned in the strategy, particularly in how we allocate water. And much of this is due to the shifting central government direction and how that impacts our timeframes in which we're able to do this, but not our commitment to these actions. While the report highlights individual examples of progress across many areas, including community engagement and advancing new partnership arrangements with Mana Whenua, joining up across the council group for the kind of organizational approaches envisioned in the strategy is an ongoing challenge, especially for an organization of our size and breadth. This is especially clear where there's not a clear leading department or a team driving coordination on a specific action. And finally, at the end of year two, there were three actions that remained overdue. All three were indicatively scoped for completion within year one, which was ambitious timing. They've each progressed over this last year and are high priorities for further action in year three and details on each of those actions, status and risks are outlined in appendix one or attachment B. And we're happy to answer any questions on those actions. Their action 1.1, apply dual framework to benchmark water outcomes. 5.1, adopt a council position to address affordable water access. And 5.2, develop a plan to address affordable water access in Auckland. Moving forward, staff are focused on progressing the 34 action scope for delivery by the end of year three. Given the volume of work, it is not overly concerning that currently 15 actions are on track for delivery, 16 are at risk of not achieving uh, a major milestone, and three are overdue. In many cases, AMBA actions have still progressed uh, significantly in these first two years and will continue to progress beyond the indicative delivery dates. Nonetheless, analysing the risks help Council understand where more attention is needed, and this includes the foundational risks to the strategy itself. Uh, so there are risks associated with the delivery of any strategy. Uh, however, staff are committed to undertaking an ongoing risk assessment and mitigation process to address those foundational risks for the strategy. Uh, through this process, staff have identified two key risks and their mitigation controls. And as you will see on the right-hand side of the screen, these risks are low organisational support for the strategy and competing priorities and obligations for staff. Both risks are being mitigated with several controls, and these include development of the exec executive level governance structure within the organisation, scheduled cross-council communications and convening of briefings for key department managers and implementing staff, and the annual prioritisation exercise to influence the council group's allocation of limited time and resources. And in the next slide, I will go into more detail on the priority exercise as a key method of mitigation. 
So given the ambitious nature of the strategy through its first three years, uh, the priority exercise is important to inform departmental business planning. In preparation for year three, council group staff participated as raters in this exercise, using a set of criteria to rate strategic actions well if they deliver the greatest impact, hold the greatest urgency for completion, uh, low risk for being derailed or delayed, and have existing momentum or links. You can find the resulting top 10 actions of this exercise listed on page 23 of attachment A, which is the main report. However, on the screen, we have summarized the key themes that arose from that exercise. Uh, as you can see, enhan enhancing resilience and our partnerships with Mana Whenua, as well as ensuring efficient, affordable and sustainable water services remain key themes since our last report. And while we have highlighted the key priority themes here, this doesn't mean that other actions won't be progressed uh, over the next year. Uh, instead, the exercise supports council staff to identify where to allocate limited resources for maximum impact to complement work already prioritised through business as usual. The next steps and benchmarks for facilitation and oversight of the strategy's implementation through to July 2025 are outlined in the hour map on the screen in front of you. Uh, to summarise, the actions include engagement with council group staff and partners, monitoring and tracking of strategic shift and action progress, and prioritisation of actions still to be progressed beyond year three. And to close our presentation, um, I would like to reiterate our purpose of today, which was to provide you with the Auckland Water Strategy Annual Progress Report for 2023-2024 and to seek committee approval of the report. Uh, we thank you for your time. Kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you very much. And I know, once again, this is a huge amount of work and covers quite a lot of um, the council whānau to get that um, reported back to us. I'll, um, I'm happy to move, and Deputy Mayor is happy to second, I've got some questions. First, from Member Henare. Oh, Morena. Um, so that that dual framework uh, that includes Matauranga Māori um, and benchmarking framework. How come that's overdue? And if it's so overdue, when we're going to see the results? Through the chair, thank you, Member Henare. Um, so there has been significant progress to advance the direction to have a dual benchmarking framework, um, including a draft framework that's been developed in year one. And over this past year, engagement on that draft framework and this action continued with those 15 Manafenua entities that were met with over the course of the year. Um, the delay in this year really stems from a shift in council's approach from working with a collective Manafenua partner to progress that piece of work to individual engagement moving forward. Um, which can you, is the approach can, can you explain next. that again? Um, yes, yeah, so in, in the de development of the draft framework that was developed in year one, council staff were working with Te Potaiao, the environment po of the Tamaki Makoto Mana Whenua Forum, and moving forward we'll be um, shifting that approach to in, uh, engaging with individual Mana Whenua entities to progress that piece of work. So that means that you will now approach 19 different organisations? And 15 have been engaged on it in this past year through the engagement that we undertook on the strategy, and then the other four will be engaged. So how long year. is it overdue by, and when's the, the report back? So the action was indicatively scoped for delivery in the first year, and that stemmed from a desire to be able to evaluate the strategy from that dual benchmarking framework, so not just from a council perspective, but also have a Mana Whenua led and developed way of evaluating our progress towards Te Muri o Te Wai. Um, and so it is two years overdue from that indicative scoping date. Um, but like I said before, there's there's been quite a bit of progress and we recognize that the need to partner with Mana Whenua for the development of that is a key part of delivering that action. And so we're moving at the pace that, um, that we're able to in that partnership approach. So during that process, um, have mana whenua been alongside all of all the step, steps of the way or um i'm 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 asking i suppose uh not what led to the decision um of of moving to individual uh working relationships but i'm 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 just wondering was that a push from mana whenua themselves 
to get rid of uh, the organisation beforehand or was it a council push and then the new, the new strategy was individual iwi? Well, there has been engagement and buy-in from Mana Whenua. The, the action itself stemmed from engagement with Mana Whenua in the development of the strategy, and so it really was directed by Mana Whenua in that sense. And the shift has just been due to the fact that that Po Te Potayao that was meeting hasn't been meeting this year, um, and so the direction was to, to move towards that individual engagement with Mana Whenua entities. So this is a, uh, I just want to get it right, this is a, uh, the initiative is a mana whenua one. The way that it um, has been embedded into the strategy came from the direction that we received in our feedback in Kōrero with mana whenua during the development of the strategy. Cool. Yes. Um, just for the last, uh, last little one. Um, Everybody knows that we have have to ha uh, address some sort of affordable water strategy going forward, and that's for everybody: businesses, um, homeowners, black, white, red, and green. I'd be concerned if they were green, but there we are. Um, is there a specific Kopapa Māori uh, push to get that part of it done? as well as, as part of the, the affordable water plan. So that action to develop a council position to address affordable water access um, has been developed mostly internally within the council group by looking at an investigation of the affordability of water, um, both for the reticulated and non-reticulated network over this past year. Um, and depending on the future steps for that action and whether it would be something that would require for a council position, to have public engagement and wider engagement, that could be something that might be considered at that point. Um, but so far, the work has been mostly internal and an investigation. So it's a yes or a no? So I was just going to add, um, which would probably give it more of a yes, uh, is that um, obviously as part of that evaluation, we're looking at different uh, communities and, and their uses and things like that. So there'll be different uh, characteristics that we want to assess. We already have information that sort of gives an indication as to uh, which people in Auckland uh, may be at a disadvantage in terms of paying their bills, for example. So we do have that sort of uh, socioeconomic lens across it. Um, we would obviously be looking to get that engagement to the targeted to the right uh, uh, characteristics that we want to look at. So I think the answer there is yes. Kia Thank you, Member Hennaday. Good questions. Uh, Councillor Baker. Thanks, team. Um, and... I mean, obviously, this is a huge piece of work. Um, just looking at slide eight, and you talk about the low awareness and buy-in across the organisation and the delivery competes with other departmental priorities and, um, and obligations. What is that lack of buy-in? How does that translate into, and does it translate into, the fact that we are actually got a lot of yellow boxes in that, um, um, I guess, in the, the status and... I guess what can we do because it's a it's a it's a strategy that has been put in place by the governing body that you'd expect the organisation goes okay we've got to give that some um, some punch and, and some um, appropriate action. I mean, what sort of direction can we give to potentially the CEO or someone to say, hey, actually, you've got to give this a bit more sort of attention. Um, and is that appropriate? Because it sounds to me it's a bit like local boards previously in the first few years where you couldn't get any punch at all. So what can we do to have you guys stop spending so much of your time, by the looks of it, running around trying to push the arm up the back of people within the organisation? Kia ora. Uh, through the chair. It is a huge challenge, I think, for any strategy of this size and um, how that gets implemented across the organisation. I think the way that it shows up in the annual report is really through especially the actions where a lot of progress is happening with different drivers in different places across the organization, but that joining up to take it to that next level for that organizational approach might be missing, and so you'll see that as a key risk um, in Appendix 1 or Attachment B for, for many different actions in general. Um, and I think there are lots of different ways that we as a team have looked at supporting that 
one, awareness of the strategy and, and really helping staff across the organization become aware of what that direction is because I think that willingness is often there. Sometimes it's just an awareness of how things can join up for that kind of coordinated approach. And then in some cases, um, and looking forward, we're all also thinking about the strategic investment areas that have been identified um, as a part of the LTP and how those can be leveraged since many of them do align with direction in the strategy for those kinds of joined up actions. Um, and then awareness more broadly by the public and others as well, I think supports that kind of, that kind of joining up. Can I just add, um, we've got uh, statements from the governing body uh, through the, uh, or liaison to the uh, CCOs as well in terms of uh, getting them to identify in their work programs how they're going to implement some of these uh, initiatives. Uh, so that's an important option. I think there's also um, an internal thing about a governance group, and so there'll be probably more of an issue uh, about, and we've been thinking about how we get the relevant uh, senior managers together to uh, make sure that there's a bit more buy-in by their departments. And I think the other comment I'd make is that um, uh, we'd be wanting to uh, look at the option of you know, how... Um, uh, relevant chairs of a committee, for example, or liaison uh, councillors could fulfil their role in their informal engagements as to uh, trying to ensure that some of these things are taken on board. I think that's the only other thing I wanted to note is that it's been quite a disruptive year, the year we're talking about, when you talk about the water services reforms and um, the desire of parts of the council to move into other entities. Uh, and, and so we're in a bit of a position for the current year, 24-25, to have a bit of a reset and a bit of a rethink. But I also wanted to highlight that the strategy in itself is durable and flexible uh, and has got the option to uh, maintain the governing body's desire to see these outcomes achieved. And I think that's the thing we need to keep in mind, is that the whole point of the strategy was to bring together our different... Uh, focus on water outcomes, whether it was through a planning lens, an operational lens, a regulatory lens, and actually ensure that there was actually um, good integration and good complementary activity across the council group. And when I sat in Councillor Penny Hulse's room in 2017, it was then an issue of how do we get, you know, you're bringing a lot of advice to committee, how do we get some of this thing better joined up? And so the, the water strategy as it then was created was about sort of trying to articulate our clear strategic direction that we want to see for the region. And basically the key element in doing that is to actually be clear and transparent as to how we're approaching that. And so that if you're a, um, a department or a CCO, you know what your particular part is in the, in the jigsaw. I think our efforts this year will be very much about trying to attribute a bit more ownership to some of the actions uh, so that we can get that um, ramped up within the relevant departments or CCOs. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Walker, online. Yes, uh, hi. I've just got a few um, a few questions that relate to um, actions that uh, might be considered for incorporation. So one, um, one matter is... Um, is around what might be termed best practice as it goes to um, water management. What do I mean by that? Uh, one particular example is the best practice um, methodology um, training and association that's been put in place around the exterior cleaning industry. Now, equally, that could be applied um, across a range of other um, business activities that are reasonably um, generic um, without going into it in a lot of detail, it can cover off um, conservation, it can cover off um, reducing um, pollution of um, waterways, reducing energy, um, enhanced performance standards. Uh, so my question is, is it possible to um, expand uh, best practice as it goes to um, water? Kia ora, through the chair. Um, absolutely possible to enhance that, and I think there is direction in many different parts of the strategy where that kind of work is embedded and is considered, especially around integrating some of our land use management practices and water outcomes. And I know 
some of the work that's been done over this past year, particularly in updating the Auckland Unitary Plan for freshwater management approaches, um, would look at some of those kinds of guidance for best practice. Um, in terms of adding additional actions, um, something that we're starting to consider, and we've mentioned this in our presentation as well, is that beyond year three, we're hoping to do a more holistic evaluation of the impact of the strategy. Um, and that kind of evaluation could inform the future direction. When the strategy was adopted, the 58 actions that are in it are a great start to uh, achieving some of the direction in the strategic shifts, but there was always an intention to go beyond that and to add to that for that 30-year really ambitious transformational vision of the strategy. Um, and so that's something that could be considered at that point as well. Okay, so, so, so how do I get some confidence that um this uh, that best practice will be embedded um, as I say it's it's occurring uh, across one industry but there are significant water users across the um, horticultural um, industry the bottling industry and others that can really benefit from um, best practice and and that goes to the circular economy as well so how can I have some assurance that we'll be following through on this uh, one thing I might add is that water care is actively working with commercial high water users on methods of reducing water use and looking at that consumption um, and reducing that towards our targets over time. So the quantitative targets that we have are one way of being able to, to move towards that as well. And so that commitment um, is part of that assurance. And perhaps if I could add, um, sure. best practices uh, uh, something that we would encourage across all the other different disciplines. Um, we, we don't expect that um, Department X only uh, looks to implement um, its what, what it knows in terms of its um, toolbox. Uh, we're basically saying there might be some other tools that you can use as well that would perhaps be more fit for purpose. So uh, I think when we scope out some of the different actions, we, we would en envisage that the people who are doing that can start to consider things like best practice and what part that plays within uh, a response to the action that's been uh, discussed. Okay, so is is that a yes that we're picking up on it then? Yes. Okay, that's great. Um, the other question I've got um, just goes to our um, engagement with um, related organisations and, and I guess it goes to what might be termed international best practice. Um, there's an entity called Water Sensitive Cities that embodies best practice for cities across um, water. How are we getting on in terms of um, joining something like um, Water Sensitive Cities and possibly other um, uh, international benchmarking and um, uh, best practice associations. Kia ora, through the chair. Um, the Water Sensitive Cities Index was actually applied, which is an international index that comes out of Australia uh, in 2021 during the development of the strategy and uses 34 different indicators and uh, a pro process to evaluate how uh, the city and the region is progressing towards becoming a water sensitive city. So that was applied in 2021 and the intention is to apply that index again in evaluating the strategy from that holistic sense again after five years. So coming up to 2025, 2026. Um, additionally, there have been conversations within the organization around membership um, within the C40 Water si Safe Cities Accelerator program. Um, and so this is another international grouping that provides knowledge sharing across different countries. Um, and so that is also being explored internally within Council Group as to what the investments would be needed to be able to join a, a organization like that and what the potential benefits of having that kind of access to, to that international experience and knowledge would be compared to the, the cost and the, the investment of joining that program. Okay, so um, just in response, I understand the merit of um, indexing, but um, membership and support is very useful. Uh, I know uh, uh, in the past I've approached Auckland University, they'd certainly be interested in partnering up around uh, water-sensitive cities because it involves university institutions as well. So is that something that we can actively look at joining? I mean, how do we, how do we progress that? 
Um, so I think uh, General Manager Kat Mackey had been previously exploring this and, and there was a question about value for money uh, in response to that particular issue. Um, I guess what I want to just reiterate is what Liv's just highlighted, which is that we can use this tool every five years and that's actually going to give us um, what we need. And I think a lot of the information that um, uh, is included, so some of the best practice guidelines, are available to us um, through our own context as well. So I, I believe there's some advice that Kat Mackey was, um, ha, ha, well, maybe maybe has provided already or was preparing, preparing it, a memo. Um, so I just need to go back and check on where that was at. I also uh, want to add by picking up on your other point about collaboration with other organizations and innovation um, type approaches that we can take through those kinds of partnerships. And there is very clear direction in the water strategy under action 8.6, which is in the pooling knowledge shift around how we develop external partnerships for innovation, research and development. Um, that action is indicatively scoped for years four to 10. So something that we would be looking at after that more holistic evaluation and um, once some of the progress has been made, how we can really meaningfully look to develop some of those kinds of partnerships and leverage those for, for the next steps of our direction as well. Okay, um, and then my last question I've got um, just goes to the issue around the um, uh, housing construction uh, methodology of concrete pads versus piling. Um, so is there any interaction between the um, water strategy and the importance of improving um, the amount of pervious surface that we've got and resilience to um, the likes of, um, of, uh, of, of flooding. By changing some of our housing methodology away from um, uh, concrete pads to, um, to piles and, and that construction also um, is much more conducive to things like grey water recycling and water recycling generally. Um, um, so is that any sort of area that we're investigating or might be looking at incorporating? Through the chair, ab absolutely. There's um, quite a bit of direction in the strategy around what we do on land and how that impacts our receiving environments and impervious surfaces are a major part of that in thinking about the kinds of impacts on our water sources. Um, and there's um, quite a bit of attention being paid to that technical advice and research that's happening to inform how we can update our planning framework to better uh, improve those kinds of land management outcomes and also their impact on our receiving environments, how we can better look at those kinds of practices and the impact they might have on the vulnerability of our structures to water-related natural hazards, including flooding. Um, and so some of that is happening from a planning perspective. And then council, of course, also has quite a big role as a partner in supporting some of the best practices. And there's also work being done on the Auckland Design Manual and other areas across the organization to think about other ways that we can work with developers and, and those industries to support the kinds of outcomes we want to see um, for our water environments. Okay, so just a follow-up question then. So does the strategy um, reference any of these other um, uh, other items of work? Uh, so we sort of got a joined up approach? I don't know that it mentions the specific um, construction techniques that you've mentioned, but um, there is really clear direction and an action around supporting the uptake of water sensitive design um, and really thinking about and better understanding and managing cumulative effects. And I imagine that that kind of those kinds of techniques and, and things that you're talking about would fit um, clearly into some of that direction that we would be taking from a, a broader perspective. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Councillor. And uh, you may remember from the workshop on the hazards and the strengthening of the Auckland Unitary Plan process, we are and will be putting a lot of that uh, through that process too, but of course we are waiting for um, direction from government when they will allow us to change our planning instruments. But that is all in there, and thank you for that reminder. Right. Um, I'll get you to step back from the table. Thank you all. Um, I think already moved and seconded yep. it. Um, don't think there's any speakers to this. Just double checking. Right. All those in favour? Aye. Any opposed? No. Oh, thank you. Thanks very much, team. Right. On to item uh, Item uh, 10, got Emma Rush, 
Uh, now this is a making plan change 81 additions to historic heritage operative plan change uh, plan change 82 amendments to historic heritage see a member here today um, operative in part so this is uh, we're very much at the end of a, a very long process here um, but I'll just get the team to explain that Kia ora, kia ora Megan sorry I didn't have you on my list Maureen everyone um, thanks um, at this, at this uh, item does relate to um, something that's at the very end of its process. So the report relates to two council initiated plan changes for historic heritage. Uh, plan change 81 added, uh, adds seven individual places and four historic heritage areas to the heritage schedule and plan change 82 updates information and amends the heritage schedule for 99 already scheduled places. Um, the report is seeking your approval to make Plan Change 81 fully operative and is seeking you to approve part of Plan Change 82 and to adopt the other part of that plan change um, because that's subject to the provisions of the Regional Coastal Plan um, and those provisions need to be referred to the Minister of Conservation for his approval prior to that part of the plan change being made operative. Um, so that's pretty much it, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I'm happy to move. Councillor Darby would, would like to second. I think there's any questions. No? Perfect. Well, that was easy. Thank you very much uh, for a huge amount of work um, for this very short item as well. But I know there's been a process before, so thank you. All those in favour? Aye. Any opposed? No? Perfect. Right, on to the status update of actions and decisions. We'll have a Deputy Mayor will move. Happy to second. No questions on that. All those in favour? Aye. On, uh, any opposed? No. Sweet. Uh, item 12, review of the Ford work program. I'll... Happy to move. Deputy Mayor second. Is there a question? Any questions? No. All those in favour? Aye. Any opposed? No. Uh, item 13, Councillor Walker, I'm sure would like to move. No, okay. Deputy Mayor, I'm happy to second. All those in favour? Aye. Right, and we will now move to uh, we will Yeah, we're gonna have We won't go to lunch. I'm pretty sure that we can get through this. But should we have a ten minute break for a, a yeah, mm -hmm. cup of tea and clear the room. Yeah. Move to confidential. confidential. Oh, I need to move to go into confidential, sorry. Um, move yeah. to go into confidential. Councillor Baker will second. Chair, yeah, I, oh, just, sorry, I just want to clarify if there's any part of this that could have been held in the open agenda. I, I'm, I'm not going to oppose going into confidential. I just want to know um, from officers if there's any information in terms of reports and papers that have already been publicly available is there yep. uh, through the check uh, councillor fletcher and members of the committee um it is very standard that anything to do with environment court appeals whether it's on resource consent or in this case a plan change is, is dealt with in confidence um the reason for that is that we will be providing some legal and planning advice that relates to the pros and cons of different approaches the council might take we certainly wouldn't want that to be in public because it could undermine the council's Steps no, going I, don't, forward. I don't want to jeopardise uh, no, council's yeah. position. Appreciate your understanding. However, that, yeah. I just want the comfort yep. in a belts and braces sense that there's nothing on this item that could be dealt with in the open agenda. The only parts of the report are factual background context, um, but they lead in very much to the discussion around the pros and cons of different options. So. Uh, normally we would see it as an overall package in the report. So the factual information around Plan Change 88, uh, the process to date, um, that is that is in the report. I guess that, that could potentially be on the open, but it's um, but the bulk of the report. No, yeah. you, you've answered my yeah, question. It really Thank just you. sets the scene for the bulk Thank of the you. report, which is legally privileged. Yep. Kia ora, Councillor Fletcher. Um, good to check those things. Thank you. Um, right, all those in favour? Any opposed? No, perfect. Right, we'll move to confidential. Um, for those online, you'll have to move to the confidential um, link. And so we'll come back in 10 minutes' time. Thank you. We may as well make it 
12. So that's in 13 minutes' time.